I'm actually delighted to see so many people here tonight, so thank you for coming. We were a little concerned in this era of uh, coronavirus whether we would have a turnout tonight, so I very much value that we've got an almost full house here, so thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet tonight, the Medjugal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome everyone here tonight, our students, our alumni, our supporters, our faculty and friends, to this very important first Utsun Lecture for 2020. This year, the series celebrates its 10th anniversary since it was launched in March 2010. And since the first lecture delivered by Jan Utsun, leading architect and son of Jorn Utsun, we've heard from a diverse range of design, planning and development leaders who have shared the design philosophies and demonst as demonstrated through their array of projects. There has been a recurrent theme in many of our speakers' work, a commitment to improving the way people live and work in our rapidly growing cities so that through their interactions with their buildings and urban places, their lives are positively impacted. And this continues today. Our recent speakers have included Spanish architects, Carmen Pinot, Fl Ricardo Flores and Eva Prats. Last year, professors Rahul Marotra and Peter Rowe, professors in urban design and planning at Harvard's University Graduate School of Design. Jung Yoon Kim, founding principal of Park Kim, a Seoul-based landscape architectural firm. Francine Hubain, a Dutch architect and founding partner and creative director of Mekonu, to name just a few in the last couple of years. In 2020, we'll continue to shape public debate on the future of cities, and we'll be promoting these through the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, as we are pr promoting these through our faculty's work, our curriculum and research agenda. And this year, we are very excited to host another stellar lineup of speakers. Our next Utsun will feature, well, our upcoming Utsun lectures will feature Australian architect Richard Hassel, whose Singapore-based architectural pro practice, WOHA, is well known for their integration of environmental and social <laughs> principles in every aspect of their projects. And later in the year, we're bringing you a lecture by Alan Ricks, founding principal and the chief design officer of Mass Design Group, an advocate for architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. Of course, there will be more, but these are just a taster of what is to come. So keep an eye on our website for more details. But now I'd like to invite my colleague, um, Professor James Werrick, and Director of the Graduate Program in Urban Design and Development, up to introduce tonight's lecture. Um, and while he's coming up, I'd just like to say that in addition to the 10th anniversary, it is also the 25th anniversary of our Urban Development and Design Program at UNSW. So it's been 25 years since it was established, so it's an important milestone for the program, and I'd like to, invite, I'd like to congratulate James for his leadership, teaching, and success in developing and nurturing the talents of many students who now hold senior roles in architectural and urban design practices across the world, like our speaker tonight. So please welcome Professor James Werrick onto the stage. Thank you so much, Helen, for that introduction. And it's, I echo uh, our Dean's welcome to everybody here under the very difficult circumstances that we have in the world today. And it's great to see you all coming to Leighton Hall for another Paul Reed lecture, which for many years now has been the first in the Utsun series in our faculty. We started the Reed lecture back in uh, 2008, so it's in its 13th year, and we did so to uh, honor our good friend, the late Paul Reed, who was one of the founding members of the Urban Development Design Program. And I'm delighted to say that uh, we have two of the other founding members here this evening. We have Emeritus Professor Bruce Judd, who was the first director, and Emeritus Professor John Lang. So please, uh, a big welcome to uh, our founders. And certainly one of the uh, important dimensions of what we have been able to do all these years has been the continuity. Uh, we, we've mixed creativity and change, but we've a, a, a lot of continuity in what we've endeavored to do in our story about the city. 
what I must also do, of course, is to thank our wonderful sponsors who have made this possible. And we go out to our friends in practice every year, and we are honored and humbled at their, at their response. And we would not be able to put on a big event as we, as we do with uh, not only uh, a big lecture, often with an international speaker, but also a wonderful party afterwards. And so the sponsors that we've had this, have this year is now for the third time um, our great friend, Mr. Wong in Hangzhou, uh, who's uh, Euro financial, uh, Euro American financial center is a remarkable development in the Shishi uh, West uh, CBD of that great city of Hangzhou. And uh, we're so honored for him to be uh, such a loyal supporter of ours. Uh, another wonderful supporter, of course, is Bates Smart, and uh, we thank uh, Philip Vivian for his commitment. The longest serving sponsors that we've had since 2010, very generous, and we'll have Philip join us on the panel to uh, review the uh, presentation by our speaker this evening, along with Felicity Stewart. Another very important spe uh, sponsor has always been Johnson Pilton Walker, gold sponsors and uh, again, very loyal to us, and uh, my good friend Richard Johnson, but also the new team that's uh, there, you know, Graham Dixon, Kyung Lee, and so forth. The um, Ethos Urban have been terrific in coming forward in recent years, and we thank Stefan Meissner and perhaps Craig Olchin and other members of the Ethos Urban team who are here this evening. Nigel Dixon taught with us for many years and was our visiting uh, professorial fellow and we always delighted at, to have his name associated with our program. Pascal Bobillier is a graduate of our program and has been, again, so wonderful in his support uh, every year. LFA, uh, Lester Firth Associates, again, great supporters, and um, an associate there is Carla Mamerell, who is our graduate and also teaches with us, and we're delighted that they, they, that they support us. Walski Koppen, uh, uh, David Walski, wonderful graduate in architecture from here. Uh, some, a little time ago, I think D David will, will forgive me for saying that, but, uh, but also in recent times, a graduate of our MUD program, and, and again, very loyal to us. And then from Albury Wodonga Habitat Planning, David Hunter, one of our graduates who supports us every year, and also Barbara Bennett from uh, Urban Concepts, who really does support us. So these are very special people who make this, this evening, this evening possible. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, it's our 25th anniversary, so we asked one of our terrific alumna to be our speaker. It's the first time we've had our own graduate to give the Paul Reed Lecture in Urban Design, and we're thrilled, really, that uh, Jiu Yu has uh, been able to do this in a very distinctive and creative way. As we can see, uh, she's these days the co-founder and managing director of a relatively new firm, AI Space Factory, which is based in New York, Shanghai, and Barcelona. And uh, just at this moment, she's in New York and was not able to come because of the coronavirus crisis that the world is enduring. But she has sent us a video, and we will, I think, very much enjoy the video that she and her New York team has have put together. So Jojo came to us with an architecture degree from the Beijing Institute of Civil Engineering and Architecture, and a little bit of experience in practice before she took on her graduate studies of urban development and design. She was with us in 2001, 2002, I think from the very start, Professor Lang recognized that she had some very interesting English language skills. And in that period, of course, many of our practices were doing considerable work in China. And uh, some of the practices needed some translation done. And so on Professor Lang's recommendation, Jiu started to work with the principles of leading firms, the principles of uh, Cox Group and uh, Crone. And, uh, in doing so, she was working on fee proposals and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, translating briefs and so on, and working with the principals of the firms. And so she grew immensely in confidence by being able to handle that while she was undertaking her graduate studies. 
Then when she finished here at UNSW, she embarked upon a, a program to become an architect in Australia. And I'm delighted to say that her first job was with Tim Schweger, who's uh, right here at the moment. And uh, then uh, when Tim, Tim moved his office to Shanghai, she worked with Peter Drogi at DEM. And one day in Shanghai, uh, I think having lunch with uh, Tim Schweger and Ann Waugh, uh, John Billman from PTW came by and over lunch offered her a job on the spot. So she joined the PTW team at that very exciting time when they were working on the Beijing Olympics and she was very privileged to work on the water cube and the Olympic Village. But after a little while she said to John Billman, this is not helping me become a registered architect in New South Wales. So please can I come back and do some contract administration and some supervision. And so she joined the, the Tony Rossi studio at PTW and worked on you know, fitting out uh, lobbies of 1960s commercial buildings being refurbished and so on, but very essential for the workbook to become registered architect. And she's the first of our graduates to achieve that, to have go through all the steps to become a registered architect in New South Wales. Shortly thereafter, she went to New York and uh, interviewed for a number of jobs, and she was offered a position at Cohen Peterson Fox. And uh, she went there in 2007. Within seven years, she had progressed from uh, a member of the team, uh, working principally with, the, with Paul Katz, their, their managing director. But she, from that uh, beginning point, she became an associate, then a senior associate, and then director of Cohen Peterson Fox, New York. And we'll see some of the work that she did in that uh, circumstance, including the 600 meter tall tower in, in Shenzhen, the Ping An Insurance Company Tower. Uh, and then that group that worked on that formed their own company, this uh, AI Space Factory, and that's what Jojo will talk about uh, principally tonight. A little bit of her Cone Pinnison Fox experience, but also where this uh, uh, advanced uh, thinking in, in the, in a sense, I suppose, the cool house idea of the generic city of, of today, but how to give it an edge and how to give it a humanizing quality. So enjoy the video presentation of Jiu Yu, and please give uh, a big clap, and we'll look forward to her presentation on humanizing identity. Hi, everyone. Uh, now it's 5.30 in the afternoon, uh, Monday, New York time, and I think it's 8.30 in the morning, Tuesday morning. I will be giving a lecture like in about 12 hours, no, 10 hours. My team is still downstairs uh, working on the um, final editing for the video. Uh, I want to apologize, I'm not able to be there in person to give this presentation uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, which partially is actually the result of uh, density and the globalization, which uh, I'll be talking about. Um, so yeah, so my team and I have been working very hard for the past few days to prepare this video. Uh, I do hope you will enjoy it. Thank you, see you later. Cities are growing. We are living in density. How can we make the city more livable? Can we humanize density? Uh, when I was growing up in China as a kid, I was very well educated and I was very well protected by my family. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, I had to do what I was asked to do uh, because that was a criteria uh, if we are good students or good person or not. Um, so I, it never really occurred to me what I wanted to do. I just kept doing what my parents, what school and what society asked me to do but I loved reading. Um, I was really, I really went out of my way to get every possible books I could read. For example, um, uh, 三个火枪手, this was, uh, I didn't know the um, English name, I guess it's called Three Musketeers in English, about how people struggle, how people try to find the real meaning to their life, how they struggle through the hierarchy of the society. Um, 
not necessarily suffering, but I think a struggle and look for meaning is a word. I guess at the moment I realized I was looking for challenges. I was looking for challenges which can have more impact on me and also on this world. The turning point was when I went to Australia. Uh, so that, that's a moment I really have to start thinking uh, what I want to say, uh, what is my opinion. To be totally honest, I don't remember what I exactly designed. Uh, I, just, I just remember, I just rem I, I guess just through that project, I remembered how to create public space. I think that's something. What I learned from urban design is how to create a better place for people. Uh, my, my first memory of working with Jujo when she joined the team, um, gosh, I think it was actually probably taking a break to go and get coffee and when she first introduced me to the flat white. Um, but especially actually, you know, spending a few moments walking around the city and, and, and just taking a moment to chat about the designs we were working on and also, uh, you know, finding these moments uh, where we could kind of catch our breath and, and um, you know, these, these kind of hu human spaces in the city that we both tended to gravitate to. Um, so I remember that about working with Jija. This uh, we had we had this friendship uh, and this ability to kind of you know leave the office sometimes and and, and share ideas as as two friends. Um, but then also uh, you know bring that back to the office um, and be able to to kind of uh, look for ways to incorporate some of those ideas, uh, those kind of spaces that we both enjoyed uh, into our work. I remember that moment uh, she came up to me uh, with the sketch and, and she says, can we put a plaza here? You know, and, and the team was so busy, we were working on this 600 meter tower, big retail podium. She was so sincere in the way that she asked and then I looked at her sketch. Uh, it had a great clarity to it and it was actually a great solution. And if you go to the project today and stand outside the entrance to that office tower, there's a plaza there, and that's because Jija at that moment had the courage to come up and say, I think we're doing something wrong. Can we do it better? PN Financial Center was a career changing project for me, not only in the sense of I learned a lot uh, about how to do a super complex buildings. I think, I think one thing is really important, and uh, in a way, it's probably more important than the, all those technical things. Architecture stuff I learned is I found my. Um, my team, uh, I found my musketeer to work with me. Um, I guess in, before Pion Financial Center, I think that if I remember all those career, um, all those moments in my career or in my school, it's all about my personal struggle. I find meaning for myself, I discover myself. It's all about like, how I, um, how I uh, struggle or fight or make effort myself. But so with Pion Financial Center, I felt I found a team to work together. I think the example is like if I miss something, someone will pick it up for me. Or if someone does something good and the other person able to make it even better. So I feel like this really has been reflected in the outcome of the PN Financial Center. Uh, when I look at the projects, I, I still like even until today, it's four years after, I can still feel this emotion whenever I saw the building, not because uh, I remember all this personal struggle, it's because the different parts of the building remember those different moments of collaborating with my team member. In 2017, we all came back and we reunion together, which is actually very rare in our profession. I guess if you know America a little bit, it's also in America people really move around. Like for for everyone to move, make the effort to return to New York and set up a company together, I think that's really precious. Yeah, so when we started a startup, you know, like starting a startup, we, all those partners, we have to sit together to think, yeah, we can say we want to make a difference, but how we want to make a difference, what difference we want to make. I worked for uh, rich developers for 10 years, so I, I really learned what they want. Uh, so I, I have to speak for them as well, if I'm talking about, you know, I want to 
be the musketeer to uh, help the pool, but I have to speak for the developer as well. Many of them actually have the same vision or, or, or same ideal as everyone else has. They also want to they also want to serve for the public. They also want their project to benefit the city as well. Um, but as a, but of course, but for being a developer, the financial return is also critical to them. So for us as a designer, how can we find a common ground, like a, to to create a project which is a win-win project? Uh, so in other words, you know, like we all admire those uh, like a grand, uh, like a Central Park in New York or Sydney Harbor in Sydney, all those natural beauty, natural park. I guess the starting point we start to think is uh, how can we bring those moments um, into our super tall building? Because I think in the past 10 years, uh, creating super tall building is always about creating this uh, um, beautiful object. I remember the pocket parks I was trying to do in university and I went to Michael I said, Michael, can we do this? Jisha came to me with the idea of putting a park in the tower. We went further than that. We lifted the tower off the ground. Uh, I think that people don't really think about that. People like, generally think the super tall buildings um, are opposite of, uh, say, Sydney Harbor, say, all those like, like um, um, beautiful natural scenes. But is there um, a way we can bring them together so we can actually uh, connect the people with nature through tall buildings. Let me show you some of the projects we have been crafting with human-centric in mind. Since you all live in Sydney, I want to start with a project we designed by the water in Shenzhen, China. Shenzhen is a city next to Hong Kong, has been experiencing 40-year urbanization, is rising up to become a truly global city and also known as China's Silicon Valley. What is missing? A city's waterfront is actually its most important public space. Can you imagine Sydney without Opera House? San Francisco without the Golden Gate Bridge? Or New York without the Statue of Liberty? Xinjiang, as a water gateway to southern China, also needs its waterfront icon. Here comes the challenge, the density. The total growth area of the project is very high, and we need to accommodate many programs, office, hotel, apartment, convention center, exhibition center, and museum, everything you can think about. If we take the conventional approach, the site will be packed with buildings and driveways, drop-offs, and ramps. There will be no meaningful public spaces left. What even more terrifying is the building will become one of them. This is the Qianghai CBD where our project is, and they are the backdrop of our project. Don't forget, our tower has only 120 meter height limit. So even it has this amazing waterfront location, but you can imagine it will be completely overwhelmed by its much bigger neighbors and become totally insignificant. We ask ourselves, is there another formula for an, another a density which can define a more human-centric city? Let's look at the site. There are two distinguished characters of the site. First one, it is the only building designated for development within this 8-kilometer long coastal park. What should we build in a park? What's your answer? Our answer is a garden instead of a bunch of top objects. How should the city meet the sea? a terrace, instead of several glass boxes. Therefore, instead of maximizing the height and set coverage like most of the developers would want the architects to do, we took a completely different approach to create a new density of connected objects which create space. The project has three-story podium containing an exhibition center and a museum. It's burned over to create an artificial hill. This thick base allows the park to flow freely through the objects and conceals a significant amount of the project's density. Now, we see the result, which is not only physically connected but visually interlinked. The arrangement of terraces surrounding the central courtyard means that every point in this project has a line of sight to another, to see or to be seen. If you walk along the water, you can just flow into the public courtyard, defined and protected by the buildings. And on each platform, there is an opportunity to watch a performance happening above or below, or simply just to sit there, have a drink, and watch the sea. When you walk or live in the building, you don't only see the water through glass window, you have the opportunity to actually step out and embrace the fresh air. 
Now, projects become a miniature city looped together. Offices, hotel rooms, restaurants, culture, and performance venues are each given terraces overlooking the South China Sea. It's no longer just an icon for the city; it's also a building shaped around people. 600 meter Pian Financial Center was designed in 2008. Back then, people celebrate height. The taller, the better. While we managed to achieve human spaces for the project, being iconic was a priority. A decade later, in 2017, we started working on Pian Ison Insurance Center, which was just south of the Twin Towers we designed. We nicknamed it as Pian An South South. We also called it Pass P A S S. It was our very first project with a new company. We won it through an open international competition with Nikensaki,、um, Rafa Vignoli. All participated the competition. Being next to its much taller brothers, can it offer something different? Can we achieve the transition from iconic to human centric? With my early idea of bringing a garden into tower, we took an even bigger step. We lift up the whole tower to let garden flow through the entire site. This does not only give the public access to the tower footprint, but also creates a seamless transition from the surrounding city to the building. Now we achieve the both visual and actual openness added base, and let the public pass through the tower instead of only looking up at the tower. The pleasant surprise of lifting up the tower is that we revealed building's fifth facade. Underside of the tower, soffit. Other than just only adding beautiful patterns to the soffit, which is decorative, we integrate the soffit panels with mechanical ventilation. The panels can breathe like morning glory. The soffit becomes alive, opening up to bloom like flowers, intaking fresh air for for the building during daytime and illuminating at night. The roof of the podium has now become part of the public domain, and will allow visitors to experience the building from a new perspective, day and night. Here's a mock-up we built to test the movements and the lighting effect. We worked with the three manufacturers over the course of one year. We designed, tested, and built three generations of the mock-ups to arrive at the final version, which is currently under construction. Now let's look at the office space itself. Today,、uh, people spend at least one third of their time at work. But for most of the tall office buildings, tenants only connect with outside through glass windows. If you are lucky, you get open view. If you are not lucky, you see another building. We have a garden as a base for everyone in the city. Now we ask ourselves: Can we have another garden at top for building tenants, so all the tenants can access the best views that the tall building has to offer? As a result, the summit of the tower is no longer occupied by the mechanical equipments, but given back to the people as their communal spaces. Along with intensive landscaping elements and open trellis roof, people can breathe fresh air, look at the views, reconnect with nature, interact, and relax. Opening up is our keyword. Now we have a tower redefining density from iconic to human centric. Density comes with rapid urbanization, increased land shortage, and environmental challenges. Do we need to move to another planet one day? Let's take a look if we can actually build habitat on Mars. In May 2019, we won the final champion for NASA's 3D printed habitat challenge after a competition of three stages and five levels. It wasn't only a design competition, but also a build competition by using the 3D printed technology. During the one-year competition, we explored the design, the technologies, and the materials that could shape Mars and reshape Earth. This window, we have less than 30 seconds to place it. It is down to the wire. I could not have scripted this better.
this window. We have less than 30 seconds to place it. It is down to the wire. I could not have scripted this better. We heard a big bang. What was that? The skylight fell through. The testing and the results are announced tomorrow. I'm nervous, yeah, but it's not a bad nervous. The goal is to finish the structure. Oh, there it is. First place goes to team AI Space Factory. So. By 2050, 70% of the population will live in cities. With all these efforts trying to find a solution for living on Mars, our ultimate goal is to rethink how we could build and live on Earth. The last slide of my presentation uh, is this 380 meter tall building in Shilko, Shenzhen. Uh, we won the competition last year and we're very proud we beat SOM, Adrian Smith and Gensler. Um, this is also a project we have been trying to apply some of the lessons we learned from our experience designing on Mars. Uh, we named the tower Lighthouse, simply a lighthouse leading to a more sustainable future. Unfortunately, we are not able to disclose the full design yet, um, but I can show you a very short beginning of this project. Earth is home to over 7 billion people. One of the most profound impacts of our growing population is how we are shaping the planet through urbanization. Tall buildings play a pivotal role in the future of cities by addressing in the challenges of increasing population, connectivity, and reduced resources. With its highly visible and accessible site located between mountains and the water, Prince Bay in Shenzhen is the ideal place to explore how we build, live, and experience the city. The Super Tower at Prince Bay will be a lighthouse to show the way to a better future for our planet. I was a student, like many of you sitting here today. It has been a long way for me to be standing here giving this presentation, and I never thought about I would ever have my own practice. Uh, I know this is a long and a hard journey, uh, but I'm confident we have the right people, we have the right team to achieve this by working together. Thank you very much for having me today. I guess not having me. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. JJ, I don't know whether you're online and whether you'll be able to join us now. Technology works, brilliant. So, so um, to facilitate this next session, um, we've invited some eminent panelists to join us up here to have a, a continue the conversation with JJ um, while she's online. Um, so first of all, I would like to invite Professor James Werrick up to the stage. And also, then I would like also to ask um, Felicity Stewart, Director of Stewart Architecture, formerly of uh, Hollenstein, Studio Hollenstein, and Stuart Hollenstein, and also a national award winner for the Urban Design Award in the Greens, for the Greensquare Library and Plaza at the 2019 AIA Awards, and also a UNSW and LUM, um, and also a great supporter of the program, Philip Vivian, um, and on our advisory board, and also director of Bates Smart Architects and chair of the Australian chapter of the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. So um, I'd like to thank Shishé for her very thought-provoking talk, and so I'm lucky, lucky enough. To, oh, are you there? Can you hear us, Shishé? Yes, very oh, well. Oh, great. Okay. So thank you, Shishé, for joining us. Can you see me? Can you see the panelists on stage? Yes. Yes. Great. So, so thank you for your talk and thank you for the, for the presentation. It was also great to have your insights as to your background and how it has shaped you. I was quite intrigued by the Three Musketeers um, <laughs> way of finding your purpose in life. Uh, but I also found that it was very um, 
meaningful in terms of helping us understand the importance of team and collaboration in defining that purpose and helping you shape the career that you've wanted to shape with AI Space Factory. You talk about your key motivation is creating better places for people. And, and you've done that primarily through um, spaces defining um, as opposed to form defining and, and being the generator of your work. Would you say that was a sort of a key difference between someone like yourself as an urban designer um, foremost in the way you've approached super tall developments? I mean, when you talked about them, you talked about space more than the actual form of the buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. I think, um, yeah, I think urban design definitely has uh, influence on me in terms of uh, space creating. Um, I think in my, um, uh, when I was taking this video, um, there, there was part was cut out of the video also asking me the difference um, between architecture and urban design because I actually, uh, studied urban design at UNSW, but uh, what I have been working on for the past, like, uh, since I left UNSW, um, I guess since I um, came to New York, um, mainly architecture. Um, so uh, there was a question asking, like in my interview, asking me uh, what's the difference and what made me to do architecture instead of urban design. Um, so my answer was, I think I like urban design. I learned, uh, as I mentioned in my video, I learned urban, I, I learned uh, how to create in, um, spaces, public space. I think public space is probably the key word I learned from urban design. Um, but, uh, but in the meanwhile, I find urban design, um, correct me if I'm wrong, all the professors and audience, but <laughs> I, I find urban design is about um, um, preparing these uh, guidelines. Uh, it's not so much about specific design, so I feel the impact on um, on the city, our, on people are not that direct. Um, that's why um, I still choose to focus on architecture, but to apply my um, knowledge of my um, understanding about urban design about spaces into, into, into the project. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, I think urban design definitely had influence on me, more focusing on uh, space um, rather than form. Um, yes. So. Okay, so I might just, what I'm going to do, Jeje, so you understand, because we've got these panelists on stage, I'm going to actually inter intersperse something you've said with people on the stage, okay? So now I'm going to ask Felicity, because I think that in relation to your work, particularly at Green Square, that was very much also um, a project about making a place and making space, as opposed to the, the building actually informing the brief. Uh, well, it obviously informed the brief, but it didn't, wasn't the generator for the form of the, the project. Would you say that that was also a prime gen generator for you in your thinking in terms of creating a place for people at Green Square? I'll just check that this is on. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. I mean, my, it's interesting that um, we're talking about definitions. I mean, my definition of urban design, I mean, being obviously more than just one site is also about a degree of responsibility because I certainly feel that with scale comes and the more scale you have, the more responsibility you have to do something with it. Um, so I find it interesting, this discussion and presentation about like claiming back space in for the public realm, um, both private and public, but um, to me, the bigger it is, the more, usually, the more opportunity or onus is on that work to do something. So certainly at Green Square, where we were dealing with, um, you know, places of new urbanisation, where there would be a very dense new urban area, that we were very um, conscious of what space was carved out for everyday life. And I think that that has to be, there's a certain balance that has to be struck and um, even in tower formats, you know, if you sort of lay the tower flat, there would be something in there that was, was given back. So um, for me, it's always this kind of ratio. Um, that's how I like to think about it. Um, Jeje, did you hear what Felicity said? Yes, very well. Yeah, okay. Yes, I agree. Yeah. 
So, I mean, obviously you're working at a scale which is super tall. I mean, it's way bigger than any scale that we, we have here in Sydney, for example. Do you think, do you feel it as a sort of a social contract that, in fact, the more, um, the higher density, the more you have to actually balance that equation of giving back to the public realm, of, of balancing what there is for everybody as opposed to the, the end client per se? Uh, sorry, Helen. Um, it was it went frozen for ten seconds. I only heard the last part. Okay, sorry. sorry. I, when we talk about projects of the scale, the super density mm -hmm. that you are working at, do you feel that there is a greater responsibility to give back to everybody, um, not just the client, the end user, uh, to ensure that yes. it enriches the public domain? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think this is actually probably one of the reasons um, I chose to uh, have my own practice. Um, I think um, during my 10 year working at KPF, uh, of course KPF is a great for firm. I, have, I had great experience there. Um, but my experience at KPF, we work for very top end developers. So all the developers, all the clients we work for are all super rich. Um, as I said, um, as I said, I think all of them actually all, um, all of them, but most of them actually also have this desire to also create uh, public space or giving something back to the city. I don't think they are just, uh, um, as a lot of people think, they are just simply greedy. Um, but uh, I felt, um, I need to choose my word carefully because I don't want to say anything negative about my previous employer because I'm actually really grateful for my experience. Um, but I found there wasn't enough um, opportunity for individual because basically I was working within a system. Uh, so there is a way how we serve a client and how we provide our architecture services. Uh, because uh, um, um, it was 600 people office, uh, so there has to be certain uh, system and certain ways to ensure the productivity, efficiency. Um, so I found um, I wasn't able to, again, have a direct impact um, in terms of giving spaces back. Uh, I still feel I was primarily focusing on uh, satisfying the, uh, the, the developers. Um, but uh, I think my goal is to, as I said in my video, I want to find this win-win um, uh, solution because I really believe um, win-win solution uh, is the only sustainable, sustainable way um, to create better architecture and also better projects, better financial return. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons we uh, founded our own company. I hope you can see through our um, new projects, we really try to give a effort on how we can create this win-win uh, composition, like the tower we are doing in Shenzhen. Uh, we lifted we lifted up the tower, so we create this uh, public space for the uh, this um, so public public has the opportunity to actually go into the tower, uh, uh, not only you know just look at the tower, but in the meanwhile, because we uplifted the tower, uh, the tower actually got taller, so the view got better, and in the meanwhile, and we still reserve the tower top space, uh, which I think. Um, any architects who worked on mixed-use building would know it's actually very challenging to uh, preserve the tower top space because it uh, can quickly be filled up with uh, cooling tower, BMU machine, all the mechanical things. Um, so I think as a result, we managed to provide, um, in a way, a uh, public space for both uh, private and public. So I think that that's still our ultimate goal, and we, we do want to give more attention to um, not only the developers. Okay. So, Philip, over to you. As someone who's working in um, this space and working with uh, developers as a core client group um, and your involvement in um, CTBUH, would you say that there is a, a stronger appetite now than previously for actually having an enhanced brief to actually creating public spaces for in, in enhancing the environmental performance, that this is something which is a 
economic imperative or is it really the altruistic in um, the architects and urban designers in the room who aspire to actually make these better places? Or is it a market imperative? Um, Helen, I think, it's, I think it's both in a way. Um, there's an element of altruism and I believe that uh, good architects are pushing to create very positive public spaces. Um, I think it's also coming from building users who are no longer happy to just be in a building isolated from their context. So today's building user are looking to be in a precinct, an activated place where there is public space for them on the ground plane, activated spaces to eat, have coffees, um, socialise, and after all, um, we no longer need to actually um, be in an office space to work. So um, work is now about working in a precinct, meeting people, um, and has the issue of collaboration and being social um, woven through it. So I think really what architects are trying to do now is create active precincts that support social life um, alongside your work life. So it's, it's, it's coming from both directions, I would say. So, um, JJ, um, you then f sort of moved us on to um, a less developer-driven project, the NASA project, the competition, which um, is pretty out there, literally. <laughs> um, and you talk about this as an alternative response to the massive urbanization and the pressures that we have on our planet as um, an alternative scenario that is being modeled or projected um, for probably a post-apocalyptic scenario, which may be closer than we think. Um, do you, was that really the brief, or is that really the premise of this, or was it really just a theoretical proposition? Well, I think when we first started doing the competition, it was totally just for fun, um, because it just sounds cool to, <laughs> to do a project with NASA in the space. Um, but through this process, uh, we begin to understand, first we begin to understand the brief. Uh, so the reason NASA had this competition uh, is because, uh, because uh, it's, it was actually very specific, it's 3D print. Um, uh, so the reason they uh, have this very specific subject is because Mars, uh, first, is very far away from us. Um, it takes a very, very long time to actually arrive at Mars. And it, it also is extremely expensive to ship uh, to deliver any kind of construction equipment or material to Mars. Um, so the challenge is, uh, can we use the material on the Mars to actually 3D print? So we just need to send a few uh, robot to, to the Mars, then they can do the work. So that's the brief. Uh, so as we understand the brief, and as also we kind of um, going through this whole process, we realize um, the challenge NASA is facing on Mars is actually the same challenge we are facing on the Earth. Uh, because we also have all this um, land shortage, material shortage. And for example, while in the construction, industry, we probably don't even think about to use concrete. Uh, but concrete is actually the most unsustainable material on the, probably in this planet um, because they are not recyclable. Um, like if the building, once the life cycle is finished, like 70 years, 100 years, whatever it is, it's going to be on the earth forever. So people hate plastic bags. Um, but the concrete is even actually worse uh, because uh, we consume more concrete. Um, we, we read some data, so concrete, uh, the consumption of concrete is the second out of wa second after water. Um, so through this process, we because we're doing a lot of material research, like what kind of material we can print. Uh, so through this research, um, we uh, got into the new material, so we can actually uh, 3D print almost everything. We can 3D print recycled plastic. We can 3D print uh, corn, and we can use all those um, uh, bio material or recyclable material to. to print. Print. So that also led us to think uh, if we can rethink um, how we build things on the earth. Um, so I think we start with just something theoretical um, and nothing really serious. It's really just kind of the, I guess, the ego of architects uh, because we did enough topics on the earth and we want to try on the Mars. Um, but through this pro process, we actually learned a lot about the challenges we are facing on the earth. Um, so that's why now, um, 
as we as I mentioned in my video, so ultimately we want to benefit the Earth. So while trying to now trying to apply all these lessons we learned through this one year uh, the adventure, um, the project we're doing on the Earth. Okay, thank you. So. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, that in fact it was really sort of a, a research project, really investigating how we could actually live more sustainably on Earth rather than necessarily how we all have to relocate to Mars. But because then I was going to really actually ask the final question to, to James to, to see in terms of shaping future cities in a, a 2050 scenario, where 70% of us are going to be living in cities. Obviously, new technologies and new material sciences are going to be part of that. But what do you see as being the, the key determinant for how we're going to live on this earth in the post-apocalyptic age? Oh. Well, thank you very much, Helen, for that question. I think, that, uh, <laughs> I think I'll go backwards, it's just a step, because I really want to thank Jija for her video presentation. And to me, I thought the way it started, uh, walking in 42nd Street in New York City, uh, sketching in the city, uh, going into Paley Park, uh, privately owned public space, very special space in New York City. I think that uh, they really emphasized that quality of humanizing density that's the theme of Jija's presentation. And uh, it, it, it's very fascinating to see that uh, fusion of the public space and private space being integrated into their imaginative transformations of the way buildings meet the ground. And I suppose the uh, project on Mars is ulti the ultimate object in space. Uh, but uh, to me, the real challenge, as always in cities, is the quality of the streets. And, and I, I just think that perhaps if you could co comment, Judge, on how, how you think you, the buildings really relate to that deep tradition of urbanism, of the life of the street. I see the very inventive and marvelous uses of technology and systems and spatial qualities and different levels and, of course, landscape fused through it, opening up to the sea and that's that wonderful project in Shenzhen. But then, uh, Let's take it back to walking in 42nd Street. So just wondering how you feel, not so much about the future of cities, but its deep recurring pattern of the quality of the street. Xie did you hear James's question, or has the technology failed us at this point? Oh, okay. Um, I missed the uh, last part. Uh, I heard it probably the first 20 seconds, I missed the last 10 seconds. Oh, we've lost the whole point. Oh, that's a difficult point. <laughs> no, Jujia, uh, uh, you, can you hear me now, Jujia? Yes, no, yes. Terrific, okay. I just loved so much the way you started by walking in 42nd Street and so forth. And, and the great challenge of, of contemporary urbanism, particularly perhaps the high density and, and, and intense urbanism of the, of the contemporary Asian city, is, is just how the quality of the street uh, has to be fought for and uh, promulgated. And I'm just wondering how you feel about how, the, how your architecture relates to the streets of the city. Uh, yes, that's a very tough question. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so I guess the two projects I presented today um, didn't show very much about um, yeah the traditional urbanism uh, how the tower meets the street I guess because both of them uh, um, I, I guess maybe also the, the the both of them uh, are located in Shenzhen and Shenzhen is a new city it doesn't quite have that urban fabric um, but what we believe is uh, uh, you have to design for its context. Um, so I, w I wish I actually showed another project we're doing in Shanghai. So I think one thing uh, also to reflect our um, own work for the past 10 years um, before we start our, we started our own company uh, was we really focused on creating uh, icons because that's a requirement of design brief from every developer. Uh, when they build tower buildings, they want to see sculptures, they want to see objects, they want to see icon. Um, so it's true, yeah, I think that there was a lack of consideration of how the tower meets the street. 
uh, and also I, I think that's also partially the, uh, in the way that um, in the way um, how the modern modernism architecture um, kind of uh, I don't blame on the modernism architecture I still love them but I feel um, from um, from me if you see on um, all his towers I think for a very younger generation on um, the skyscrapers and tall buildings just become um, more and more generic. Um, and it's um, like a, a tower in New York could be the tower in Dubai or could be a tower in Shanghai. Like a, you, can, you, you can name all those actually on um, maybe the 20 tallest building on CTBH website. Uh, they probably can all locate it in another city um, because they kind of don't have the context. I think that's one thing we actually realize and we're trying to what we're trying to do um, is we're trying to make the building actually designed uh, within its context. So we we do think that that's uh, very important. I think uh, that's a uh, very tough question, and we probably still haven't done enough. Um, but that's definitely also on our agenda um, to to um, to create design which is more contextual. Thank you, Shishi. Um I, th I mean, I think one would have to acknowledge that the urbanism that um, is being explored in these projects is quite different from the tra traditional cities. So, mm -hmm. trying to find new diff and different ways of engaging the public in the public interface is par for the course. And 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 to your credit, you've actually innovated in quite clever ways in terms of interpreting that in a way which is relative to the the context. Um, I'm going to throw open the questions to the floor. If there are any, a couple of questions from the floor, we've got time for one or two questions. How do we rebuild and build cities? James. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how to rebuild oh, yes. cities for the future. Well, are we talking about well, rebuilding cities for the future yes. or building we, cities for the future? Because we have might be to different. rebuild cities that exist. Do okay. we not? Uh, yes, okay. All right, no, I just wanted to make now, sure. That, how do we okay. do and how do we regenerate existing creations mm. for the future? It, okay. Well, not demolish them, yep. not rebuild. It might be just worth relating to the, the uh, speaker's work. Yep. yep. Well, I, I, it's really to just night, and so we should ask her to respond. But I think that really following on from what Helen was saying in response to our previous uh, brief discussion, I think what, what is, is coming through from this very imaginative work of the AI space factory is a, a, a new fusions of space. It's by no means the uh, conventional uh, division of the street and the building and, and the assemblages of individual enterprises and their expression and the lived reality of, of, of people in space. So I think that it's, it's uh, anticipated in, in Hong Kong and other cities, which like the cities without ground qu uh, qualities of Hong Kong, which have got all sorts of different layers of, of porosity of moving through cities. And that's the, what I sense in Jiu uh, and her team's work, how imaginatively they're trying to work with a new level of porosity at every level, ecologically and in movement terms and systems in terms of uh, performance of buildings. I think that that integration, which is in a sense a space factory advanced technology solution to the complexities of city building, is very exciting and very distinctive. It takes the commercial world to another whole other level compared to the generic skyscrapers that we've seen. Uh, I don't know whether yeah. Joe could comment on what I'm saying about their idea of the city and porosity. Yeah. yeah. Porosity, um, opening, uh, all those other key words we are trying to look for. Um, I think rebuild the city is a, <laughs> too big a question. Um, but I think uh, also going back to what uh, um, uh, Philip Vivian was saying about social engagement, which I think is also because we are in a social media um, generation. Uh, so I think for for the um, previous, like the last generation of modernism uh, skyscraper, uh, like for what we have been working on, I think um, one thing I mentioned, I think looking for um, um, being iconic uh, sculpture, I think that was one of the priorities. And the other one was, I think, um, is um, minimalism, uh, efficiency, 
um, I think that's like what uh, um, Miss Building is representing. I think that's influenced uh, many, many architects. Um, like uh, we all think, um, you know, modern architecture means those, those really simple, slick glass box. Um, but I think uh, nowadays with all those technology, with iPhone, with um, uh, social media, uh, we live in a totally different uh, generation. And also, uh, I think because of all those um, environmental challenges, uh, I think interaction, um, a stage they can um, socialize, and also how they can reconnect with uh, nature, and also uh, health. I think health and well-being, both mentally and physically, are both uh, very important in uh, in today's. Um, like I guess, especially now we talk about coronavirus, um, it's actually, uh, it's actually, yeah, partially as a result of the globalization and also densities. Uh, so I think those are the new challenges we are facing, uh, which I think the traditional um, modernism architectures, the skyscrapers cannot address those issues anymore. Um, so I'm looking for new ways. Um, I think in terms of architecture, like how we can open up architecture, uh, I think the other thing we didn't really go into depth uh, was how we can use the technology uh, to really transform those buildings. And yes, uh, how, uh, can we not demolish those old buildings, but use technology to actually open it up and to transform? Uh, I think that's also um, an, yeah, a challenge and also one of the agenda on, on our table. Okay, thank you. Philip, did you want to just add something? To yeah, I, I did have something to add, Helen, and it's, it's perhaps in part response, but it's also you asked um, what will the city be in 2050? And um, James, you've talked about porosity and the street. I'm at, I think looking forward, we've, the city is going to evolve into one that is far less car dependent. Um, we, we've got car dependent. Um, you know, it's, it's a very carbon intensive form of transport um, and we've got to uh, get rid of that carbon intensity and we're also heading towards technologies that um, can reduce our motor vehicle use. So I'm wondering if our cities will A, need to be retrofitted with um, uh, public transport that's much less carbon intensive, but I think as we become less car dependent, I'm wondering if we'll see a shift um, and you mentioned walking down 42nd Street, and, and you still see that the, the street is 80% dedicated to cars, and if you're lucky, 20% to the pedestrian. I'm wondering as we head towards 2050 and we retrofit our cities for the future um, in a way that we can enjoy them, that we'll, we'll shift that um, ratio so that our cities are more about people space, much less about motor vehicle spaces, and we'll head towards a truly sort of human city um, that is low carbon in the 21st century um, would be a, a, a sort of optimistic vision. And I'm looking at um, one of Gigi's designs, which was the Ping Ang Tower, and I, I noticed the raised walkways which are going, I assume they're there because they're going across these um, uh, massive eight and ten lane freeways and it's literally the only way to cross the road. Um, and of, of course it creates the challenge of streets in the air and um, you're not actually occupying the street. And I, I wonder and hope as we um, reduce our dependence on cars if um, we can eliminate those sort of raised bridges and rediscover the, the ground plane because I can see Gigi is responding to a context where people are forced into the air and I just wonder if yeah, it is rather going Caribbean, forward we isn't won't it? be. Yeah. You were sorry, Felicity, you were going to say something. I was just going to say I completely agree with Philip and that this change is happening in Sydney now. So with the release of our local CBD government's new goals, I mean these goals are there are three main themes emerging. The greening of the city, uh, social inclusion, and claiming back space from the private vehicle. These are like the goals of our city for 2050 that have just kind of been announced and, you know, it's happening. So in this kind of inevitable, inevitable period of a healthier, more inclusive and more generous city, um, I think it calls into question a lot of projects that that are happening sort of globally around the world um, and how our sort of, you know, I would call it an obsession with height relates to some of these things. It's a great challenge and I think um, particularly the um, Shenzhen waterfront project I thought was quite remarkable in how it sort of reframed that question and said, 
well, hey, you know, we can have um, icons, but they don't necessarily have to be tall and they can be generous. And I thought that was a really interesting, mm -hmm. generous project. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll have a comment. <laughs> but I was just saying, I think that um, what's interesting about is that sort of morphing of the traditional values of urbanism, which we value, which is a people-centric city where people are engaged and can socialise with the imperatives of new technologies and, and, and hyper-density, which we actually don't experience in this country, mm -hmm. and the challenges that, sh yeah. that she is having to grapple with and trying to manifest in a way where you've got all these competing agendas yeah. of global globalisation and, and economic drivers. Mm -hmm. So I do think that urbanism will shift. It won't be going back to the future. It'll be actually a new future, but I hope it will, as you say, be greener, more sustainable, more inclusive, and less car dependent. But I think, James, if you, I unless you want to have the last thing, word. Just, yep. uh, just very briefly, I think um, Felicity is right, of course, that that, uh, that project is a very special one, Jujo, the one that's in Shenzhen with all the horizontal elements. But just very briefly back on Ping An Tower, uh, it's an extraordinary project, as we can see. Uh, but uh, that network that you referred to, uh, Philip, uh, is operating at many levels, and of course it's plugged into, the building is plugged into the high-speed rail station of Shenzhen and the metro system of, of, of Shenzhen. So it, it is, in fact, an expression of the, 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 those advanced systems of movement, mm -hmm. well, the old one of the metro, but the advanced one of high-speed rail. And so I think that even though we might see it as an expression of a super tall tower just standing alone, it is in fact literally plugged into a very complex mm -hmm. ecology of the city, of how people move through, move through at, at different levels. Yes, I, I agree. Um, so, Xie we would like to thank you for um, joining us here tonight. Um, I'm not quite sure what time it is there, but... It's quarter to four in New York, everybody. <laughs> no, it's quarter to five. Oh. It's not oh. Well, thank you so much for being so vital at such a, a demanding time in the evening. <laughs> or morning, no I should say. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing with us that, that incredible video presentation. So um, next time we'll get you here in um, person, we hope, and, yeah, and I hope it's not too long. But in the meantime, can you please join me in thanking our speaker and also our panelists tonight.